Well, good afternoon from London and welcome to Colour It Stone. Uh, this is a webinar devoted to two subjects, really. One, the abstract and psychological question of the use of colour in architecture and its effects. And uh, the other, of course, the physicality uh, and the texture of stone as a material, which, of course, can't really be experienced on screen. It can be experienced uh, in real life. But we can certainly discuss it um, on screen, which is what we're going to do this afternoon. And shortly, um, we'll hear presentations, firstly, from uh, Gurkhan Karakush, writer, uh, curator, proselytizer, I think it's fair to say, for the virtues of, of stone, not just produced in Turkey, but stone in general. But he is an expert on the whole Turkish scene. And then following him, Craig Copeland uh, from Pelly Clark and Partners, an architect, but also a sculptor and an artist uh, with a, a profound interest in the use of stone, uh, both for its textural uh, and its uh, colour virtues, properties, characteristics or attributes. Before we come to our main speakers, um, I'd like to invite a comment from uh, my World Architecture Festival colleague, Jeremy Melvin, who's been curator at WAF since 2008. Uh, and Jeremy, I think it's fair to say that while we've seen many winners um, at WAF, which have used stone as a material, it perhaps, perhaps hasn't had the kind of emphasis that certain other building materials have had because they get very specifically promoted by certain, you know, trade organizations or whatever it might be. Stone, in a sense, is a kind of the universal, it's always been there. I wonder if you have some observations about this. Well, I think that's absolutely right. It seems to me that stone has three great virtues uh, in uh, architectural applications. One is it lasts a very long time. I mean, I know that if you take um, the great Gothic cathedrals, most of them are now on their third or fourth generation of stones making the same building. But, but stone basically lasts pretty well, which is why most monuments tend to be made out of stone, certainly traditional monuments. The second great virtue it has, I think, is texture. And the texture of stone, of course, can vary very, very widely from being smooth, almost like a mirror. You can almost use it uh, as a sort of semi-reflexive material. You can certainly reflect light off it. Um, and, uh, but it can also be quite rough. It can be quite tactile. I'm thinking of something like Palladio's Palazzo Tieni in Vicenza, where, you know, there's a sort of brooding menace to the roughness of the stone. Um, and then the third great virtue is a variety of colour that stone offers. Now, obviously, some stones uh, have a wide variety of colour themselves. But if you talk about, or again, think about the great um, uh, late medieval buildings just before the Renaissance in northern Italy, they use stone in a polychromatic way. So I think stone has got an enormous uh, range of virtues in architectural expression. But I also suspect that for those reasons, it was rather tended to be shunned by modernists because stone actually told you what a building would be. Whereas the modernist dream was that the mind of the architect would create the form and everything else. So materials like concrete became, came to the fore. So I think, you know, that may be a part answer to your question, which is why have we not seen so, so many really great stone buildings at WAF. I think it's an interesting point about that, which is the extent to which, I mean, rather like brick, um, one makes a distinction between a structural material and what these days can be a cladding material. Um, one, of the, the, one of the big changes, I suppose, in the world of stone in recent years has been the extent to which it can be part of a cladding system rather than being load-bearing. 
And as I say, rather like brick, this rather transforms the attitude of the architect or the designer to how they're using it. There's a certain what you see is what you get as cladding, but what you see isn't what you get as a structural load bearing piece of masonry, as it were, the sort of fortress or castle syndrome. Yes, I, 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 I think that's right, that, um, uh, you know, arch architects or, or um, modernist architects in particular are very suspicious of, um, you know, a thin sheet of, of cladding around the building that, that um, could be seen to um, mitigate against reading it in purely formal or structural terms. Um, and reducing stone to a cladding material uh, creates another problem which is that unlike if you think of the great curtain walls of Mies van der Rohe or someone like that, you know, he used materials that could be um, made to conform precisely to what he wanted in terms of shape and in terms of um, effect, texture, colour. Whereas with stone, you know, there is always a grain to the stone, there's always a quality to the stone that will talk of something other than architecture, whether it's geology or culture or whatever, you know, it could be debated endlessly. But the stone is not a neutral material. It's always an active participant in the building. I mean, in that sense, this, this sounds like an advantage rather than a disadvantage. And I'm, I'm sure that Craig might have something to say about that later on. But it's a bit like, um, or it, it, it's a bit like the argument about brick slips. I mean, is it honest to show a building which apparently um, is, is load-bearing uh, um, masonry, whereas, in fact, um, bricks become tiles. I think it's a very interesting question. Quite obviously, uh, they are authentic brick slips, um, and stone cladding is completely authentic stone. It's just a different use of it, and I... It, I, 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 I'm wondering whether this is a big deal anymore, or whether it's whether whether it still holds thing holds holds things back. Well, I I, I think architects are still beholden to um, what I think of false premises, sort of like honesty in structure. You know, as you say, uh, a piece of cladding can be a very honest piece of cladding. I remember my old friend and colleague Peter Blundell Jones saying, "We all know what it means." Uh, to have a brick wall compared to a, a representation of a brick wall. Well, the representation of a brick wall in, you know, vinyl or something might be a very authentic piece of vinyl trying to be a brick wall. And I'm reminded of what Ruskin says about this, who is obviously held up as one of the apostles of truth to materials. But when he talks about the effect of marbling in end papers in books, he says that um, although, you know, it, it, it's attempting to be marble, or it resembles marble, and it isn't marble, which would make it, in those terms, dishonest. But he says it's so established as a, as a technique that no one would think it really is marble. It's actually doing something else. And I think architects need to make that sort of adjustment to, to understand that, you know, stone can be a very expressive piece of cutting material, even if it's not being used structurally. There's no reason why it has to be used structurally. Now, and I also understand that, um, you know, the, the demands of modern engineering uh, or modern uh, liability mean that it's difficult to use stone structurally because it's harder to calculate its, um, its strength compared to a, a steel column or a concrete column. And, um, and so, uh, you, you know, that's one of the reasons it becomes used as, as, as cladding. But then, work out how to express, use it to, to, to make an expression out of cladding. And it seems to me that the, the, the natural grain and texture of uh, stone can do that extremely well. It just needs some imagination. And actually that should be welcomed by architects because one of the crucial things about um, stone as, as it were, a found and amended material as opposed to a produced material let's say like, you know, aluminium panels or something like that. Uh, stone up to a point is what it is. But um, as you said, stone can be very different depending on where it's come from and how you want to use it. It can be 
uh, I'd say almost a plastic material given today's um, cutting techniques and uh, the, the technologies of, of sanding which were known to master craftsmen, but we, we can replicate um, up to a point for use of, of, of it as a kind of uh, mass material on large buildings. And I think at this point, this is probably an appropriate moment to bring you in, um, Gurkhan, on, on, on this. And please give us your wisdom, uh, a lifetime of experience in thinking and designing with uh, and in stone. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Q, Paul, and Jeremy for those comments. Uh, um, I enjoy talking about architecture in stone. And uh, I appreciate uh, both your and Jeremy's insights and some comments. Uh, I think the architecture community uh, doesn't get to speak as much about architecture in stone as it should uh, because of some of the dynamics you talked about and from the modernist period, the cladding issues. Uh, but as uh, you both mentioned, architecture in stone has been with us uh, for a very long time. It's influenced how we approach the construction and architecture. It's very central to both uh, uh, of those activities, let's say. And my job today will be to kind of show you um, a little bit of the past uh, in architecture and stone from the particular geography that I'm located in. I'm uh, here in Istanbul today. Um, and personally, uh, uh, where I grew up in Turkey before I moved to the States was an area known for medieval architecture and stone. So in my childhood, I walked around various uh, a 10th, 11th century stone buildings, one of them I'll show you today. Um, so very much it's part of the life uh, of this geography, uh, this architecture in stone. So let me share my screen. Okay, you all see it? Yeah. Okay, so a um, lot of slides, I'll go through pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, a lot of images and these are all all the marbles and natural stones you see here will be are all from Turkey and this geography. So uh, the reason I call this the architectural opportunities of natural stone uh, is as Jeremy uh, spoke, uh, there is a certain inclination to working in stone uh, that's been uh, with us uh, that has changed perhaps in the last hundred years. And these inclinations are the ones I want to talk about a little bit today. So we're going to speak a little bit about um, uh, history of stone and architecture, specifically from Turkey. We'll look at some natural stone types from this geography, because we often talk about marble and we often talk about perhaps travertine, but there's a, a wider variety of natural stones that do exist uh, and are used uh, in different ways. And then we'll look at some examples in contemporary architecture, um, uh, most of them from Turkish architects, as Paul said, I'm a proselytizer for also uh, architecture from Turkey. So why natural stone? Uh, just quickly, natural stone is unique. Each stone sits in a certain geology under the earth for many, many years um, and produces its own texture and uh, color, uh, which is the, the subject of our, today's lect of our presentation, colored stone. So it's very distinctive. Um, it endures and marks time. Uh, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, this marking of time uh, is something that stone really provides for in uh, monuments and things like this. Um, it provides some structural in integrity with diverse textures. Uh, and uh, uh, it's have this, it has this mix of beauty, strength, and durability, which I think um, provides different uh, applications, but uh, in some ways very flexible, but also uh, provides different opportunities uh, for the architect in terms of design. Um, and of course, it's natural. I mean, it's been sitting in the ground and uh, there's a wide variety of cuts and colors, uh, but it's been, uh, it's a natural material uh, that is, dates back to the origins of the human civilization. Uh, and how does that do that? This is a monument from Turkey. It's called Göbekli Tepe. It's about 12,000 years old. It's a series of monoliths uh, around a central monolith on top of a hill in central Anatolia. Uh, it's this, this project, uh, the archaeological project here has kind of rewritten some of the history of early uh, civilization about how we went from hunter-gatherers to sedentary life. Uh, so uh, the first 
examples of sedentary life, for example, in stone. Uh, uh, in the Turkish geography, we quickly move, uh, this is about 10,000 years later, about 9,000 years later, this is the Lycian civilization. And again, building in stone inside of the geology and topography. Uh, this is uh, the Lycians uh, were known for uh, building, uh, were known for building uh, 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 in, in monuments, also in stone. This is one of their sarcophagi, which now is in Berlin. Uh, and then quickly moving to the Greco-Roman period, uh, uh, correctly moving to the Greco-Roman period, uh, we can see uh, this is in uh, Bergamo or Didyma, I'm not sure, but uh, the Greco-Roman period, the expression in the different classical orders uh, was uh, the sort of golden era of architecture in stone. Um, I think this is in Didyma, uh, this uh, the temple of Apollo, I believe. Uh, and then Ephesus later on in the Roman period. As you can see the nature of the stone and the architecture, we have much more uh, defined uh, pieces of the, uh, these facades, the classical orders, the between the columns, the, the, the uh, entablature gets much more ex expressive, much more uh, uh, working with the different stone uh, uh, bits, the textures to create uh, uh, these compositions. Uh, and then moves on architecture and stone to urbanism, whole streets, arcades. This is also uh, a Roman period uh, building in, uh, in Ephesus, a street uh, where we have uh, stone both as pavement uh, and as part of the arcade in the main street. Um, later on, it, this is a uh, building, uh, this is in Pamukkale, uh, uh, which is in Denizli. Hierapolis is the name of the city, and this is all travertine. Uh, again, you can see how stone, it's a kind of field, uh, uh, it's a con continuous fields of stone, both as large pavements, uh, large pavement stones, to these more simpler, uh, this is a market area, so you can see that the uh, that the order then is simplified for this more functional and mercantile part of town. The expressive nature of the stone uh, is, is, is here is in a much more simplified language. Uh, um, uh, and uh, this, this is in travertine. And you can see also the beginning of masonry systems in the Roman period, uh, such as these arch stone arches uh, and stone gateways. Uh, Turkey also has uh, some interesting uh, sort of sidelights of natural stone. This is obviously the Cappadocia area where uh, during the early Christian period, architecture and geology were mixed such that a piece of natural stone was then turned into a building, kind of sort of confusing and conflating architecture and geology. Uh, here we can see that the, the natural stone uh, 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 slabs, rocks, uh, have then become carved out uh, uh, to create and then painted to create a, uh, an architectural condition. Uh, you can't really call this a building as much as it's an opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, create a space by a negative uh, act of architecture, which is a negative act of construction. So this is an interesting proposition stone. And the thing that will, from the part of the world that I grew up in, this is in Kayseri, I grew up near here, and this is mid medieval uh, Turkish stone architecture from uh, the Seljuk period and uh, the elaborate carving techniques of this period uh, are quite well known and uh, provide a maximum expression of, a, uh, of uh, these more volcanic stones in basalt and andesite. These are uh, particular to this area. And this is lastly Mardin, where you can see a whole hillside of settlements uh, in all natural stone masons. Um, so that's sort of the background uh, of this geography that I'm from, and uh, the architecture uh, is very much guided by the types of stones uh, that we have here. And I'm going to go quickly through these five types and sort of try to give you an example as, uh, of how one can build with these stones uh, and these natural stones. First, I'm going to get a look at marble. Marble is a metaphoric rock, uh, and uh, uh, it, it is a softer stone primarily made of calcite. Marble is known for its colored veining, uh, and its veining causes certain mineral deposits. Often those mineral deposits are what you see uh, uh, in that vein, and that vein's uh, uh, color qualities, based on whatever mineral deposit it encounters, uh, uh, creates these unique conditions. These are marbles from Turkey that uh, are quite well known. Uh, Anatolia, Anadolu, 
and we have uh, from these uh, beiges and whites uh, to uh, the famous Marmar marble, which is uh, uh, near Istanbul, to uh, various travertines. So this this color palette is the color palette that, uh, that uh, you find a lot of buildings in this geography. Uh, and I think it's one of the important aspects of marble is its translucency, um, has a certain depth. You can see here this uh, uh, sculpture uh, from uh, Anatolia from the uh, Hellenic period, the, there's a certain, uh, the light actually moves inside the marble and bounces around a little bit, comes back out. So that translucency really uh, uh, makes the surface of the marble quite uh, uh, quite uh, active surface because it's absorbing the light. Uh, the light is then, uh, then, is allowed, then bounces back out to kind of create these interesting conditions. Um, it adds significance and substance to space in terms of its color. Um, this is a project in uh, Turkey by Mustafa Tonar, and you can see the different veining and the different colors and the different patterns used, this unique veining patterns. Uh, obviously, some of the sources of this are in architecture from Turkey. You know, one of the four, uh, famous examples is the Hagia Sophia Byzantine Church, built in the 16th century AD, which uh, used marble as the most expressive aspect of its architecture. Uh, the Byzantine period, uh, was downplayed for many, many years uh, because of this uh, expressive coloristic quality uh, when compared to the classic Greco-Roman style Byzantine architecture was seen as something backward. But I think we, uh, we, we, we now know that its use of coloring uh, it was quite unique. All these different marbles were collected from throughout the Byzantine Empire of the time uh, to create these different surfaces and different techniques. Uh, from as west as Italy to Africa, all of these uh, different types of marbles uh, here uh, were used both structurally, but I think importantly with the interior decorative program to kind of create this fusion. Uh, you can see here this, what we call book match, where you take one uh, slab of tile and then you turn it out. The marbling technique that uh, Jeremy was mentioning is actually has its sources in some of these decorative aspects of marble. But also if you look up here, you know, we have a, uh, these carved uh, uh, carved bits with mosaic bits. So this kind of union of carving, decorative, and the veining, I think, uh, shows the opportunity of one and the different colors. And these marbles are 1,500 year old marbles, but they're quite vivid uh, in their expression. The same marble is, as you can see here today in interior, there's not that much difference in the color. This Elizabeth cherry. Uh, color pattern and texture finish are the most important. Uh, uh, we can see here in Marmara marble, uh, which has this natural striping. Uh, you can use it to create the same kind of surface qualities with uh, the, ge the geometric orientation of the veins uh, and then use that uh, with different tiling techniques. Um, the cladding is, a, is an issue that Paul talked about. So we have different cladding techniques. Just want to, you know, this is a building by Taban all of us. We have uh, handset cladding, uh, which is uh, put on load bearing fixtures. So these kind of systems are, 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 are widely prevalent uh, in, in our field, uh, working with cladding systems and uh, different mechanical fixings uh, in architecture. Uh, but you can also use cladding, you can use a marble uh, uh, surface as a rain screen uh, with a back ventilation uh, uh, into an interior drainage cavity. So we have this flexibility in terms of of, uh, of the different cladding systems now is allowing for ventilation and allowing the marble surface to be much more articulated, as you can see here. Uh, it provides spatial continuity marble. And I think that's what's important. You know, one material used in different ways, and I think we'll see that in Craig, can create a kind of unified and uh, a, a continuity in spaces going from outside to inside. So uh, I'll just quickly look at some of the different ways you can treat these surfaces just very quickly. You, have, you can bush hammer it, you can tumble it, which gives, you know, the bush hammer gives you a little bit of a, uh, of a surface there, slightly uh, 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 some cracks that allow for light to bounce off of it. Tumbled, honed is a, a little bit more uh, uh, reflective, sandblasted, again, uh, it's, it's less, uh, a less uh, uh, detail on the surface, uh, brushed and polished, which you often see. Uh, you could also carve marble. I think this is something we found now in the, in the last 10 years, carved marble surfaces uh, in different geometries. Travertine, 
uh, it's actually a variety of limestone. Uh, it has its origins in subterranean mineral springs is where, where cold water, uh, where hot water comes out. Uh, and they travertine uh, is very popular. It's a little bit less expensive than uh, uh, marble and uh, but has the same patterns and understated colors. And in Turkey, we have a variety of colors based on whatever minerals you have. And it creates a kind of informality. Here we have some big split face, uh, split face uh, travertine blocks. Uh, and then also we have different surfaces, tumble, filled and honed of, uh, this I, I like to show this slide because this is actually where you can see, this is actually real travertine in terms of it hasn't been processed. And you can imagine the hot water was gurgling through here for millions and millions of years and creating this very unique geometry. And then we get to have this, you know, uh, in our backyard or in our interior. I think this is very unique uh, mineral conditions. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, the different travertines there. Let's not forget that, uh, that uh, patterns, tiling and coursing are an important issue. Uh, uh, we have many, many different over history, Renaissance, Greek, Roman, uh, uh, different patterns and coursings that we can use. I think this is arch architects should look a little bit deeper into these kind of coursing techniques uh, as, as a way to kind of give character to individual features of uh, their architecture. Uh, limestone, uh, it's a little bit softer natural stone. Again, uh, in Anatolian geography, we have a lot of limestone. Uh, it's, it was used often in Ottoman architecture, especially here in Istanbul, uh, because we have lots of uh, limestone uh, quarries nearby. Uh, it's very soft and easy to, to process. Uh, so you can see here these limestone, uh, this is a limestone wall from here in Istanbul, but you can also give it, uh, here's a modern application, uh, uh, um, uh, making it more uh, lean and, and more spare geometry. Uh, and the last two types of stones, I'm, I'd like to do this because I think we don't get a chance to talk about all these different types of stones, so bear with me a little bit. Uh, we have basalt and andesite, which are igneous stones. Uh, these are coming out of lava. Uh, they're much more durable and resistant to corrosion and pollution, very ecologically oriented basalt. If you use them both interior and exterior, they look like this, but well, you can make them look like this. Uh, you know, they're very natural material. Uh, cut them down, you can make them into natural stone walls. Uh, the andesite comes in a nice reds uh, and uh, in wall textures like this, but also can be carved. Uh, much of these uh, medieval architecture in Turkey is made from these kinds of volcanic stones. Uh, dolomite, not a very well-known stone, but again, from our geography, it's a little bit harder than marble. It's known as Marmara White, uh, very much used in sculpture uh, in the Roman Byzantine Ottoman times. You can see it here as, as gravel, here's some, uh, but very hard uh, and very uh, crystalline, uh, as you can see, very, uh, and then the, its veining is very particular uh, because it's so hard, the, the, the water, uh, doesn't have an opportunity to go down as much as it goes across the existing veins. Uh, and lastly, onyx. Uh, this is a very rare and exotic stone. Uh, it's translucent um, and uh, it's an accent feature. This is what it looks like in a raw state. This is what it looks like in a slab state. And this is what usually most people see it as backlit uh, uh, with these different... Uh, the onyx comes from areas where there is cold water coming out. So travertine is hot water. Uh, and onyx is cold water. So the difference in the natural uh, thermal water creates this. And I'd like to show this slide. This is actually, you can use onyx in a different way. You can top light it. And again, the, the light bounces in to the, uh, to the travertine, I mean, into the onyx and creates a different condition. So I think this is another opportunity uh, to use different types of travertines. So that's sort of the range of uh, uh, stones we have here in Turkey in the last five minutes, eight minutes, I'm gonna go through some buildings. Uh, look at. Uh, uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'll take about five minutes. Look at some uh, uh, buildings by Turkish architects here in Turkey. Uh, this is Han Tumer taking Ottoman. This is an old uh, 19th century building called Salt Galata, which is, now, uh, which is now a kind of a contemporary cultural center. And this is a marble marble walls. Uh, you can see here by Ottoman. Uh, you can see that expressive quality, changing textures, creating this articulate uh, interior, interior walls. Uh, that works with the existing neoclassical building uh, and these existing marmor marmor marble stairways. Again, Turkey and Istanbul has used this marmor marble for many many years because it's uh, very close by. And you can see that you can also uh, use both the striping of the marmor marble, but also create a different geometry on top. These small holes down here 
uh, that create a secondary geometry with the veining and then also this three-dimensionality of the marble uh, where you can each individual piece is then it seems like it's a big block uh, uh, and you can see how it also works with the pavement there uh, and also round pieces uh, using the veining. Uh, we have lots of natural stone buildings in the Byzantine and Ottoman period and we can see how marble works with that here. There's an Aragon Old Chalistan. There's an architect, there's an advertising office in Istanbul. Uh, again, one of the andesites, this is an embassy by Han Tumartek, a Turkish embassy in Mongolia. Uh, this is in Mongolia. I don't know if anybody's been to Mongolia, but it's very cold and windy. And these buildings sit out in the open. So you need to protect as much as possible. Uh, so the andesite was used on the exterior uh, as a facade uh, element. Uh, and then, on the interior, different kind of beiges are used. And also, uh, uh, andesite is a natural material. You can see how it works well with uh, timber. Ottoman Hammam. This is by Sinan. It's the Kilic Ali Pasha Hammam in Istanbul. Uh, it was renovated by Jafar Boskut architects. Uh, here it is sitting on the street. Here's the interior. Uh, and you can see the Marmara marble again, uh, how it works with light uh, coming from the top. Uh, and how these contiguous marble pieces creates this very clean and organized interior and light water. Marble works well with water, pools, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, it's an opportunity to do something with reflective surfaces and uh, 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 reflective surfaces with water, which this hammam is, is, is full of. Uh, this is a building I showed earlier, Toner Architects, again, different types of marble uh, veining with, diff with on, the, on the ground here, uh, water jet cut tiles. Water jet allows you to create any kind of geometry you want, uh, and it's one of the CNC-based cutting techniques. You can see this column wrapped in marble, uh, and then the whole interior where glass and marble work together uh, to create a kind of uh, union of color and light. Uh, our uh, presentation today is uh, about color and you can see how all these different colors work together. And uh, this, is a, uh, this, this is a store showroom for Turkish uh, traditional uh, 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 home furnishings. So you can see how carpets work well with the stone also. Uh, we talked about the softer limestones and this is a softer limestone uh, facade by Bonan Ekinj, also in Istanbul, creating this pattern, which then uh, uh, has two levels, both it's a relief pattern, but it's also incised within that uh, top relief uh, layer is another geometry you see up here, quite expressive, quite vivid. And these types of limestone surfaces over time, they get harder, so it has creates a different patina. Uh, Tabano Architects, this is a Congress center in Libya, and widespread use of onyx here. This huge onyx interior uh, with uh, uh, working with another marble uh, surface and so you can see how both uh, uh, light coming, sunlight coming from uh, the exterior and also this interior work together with onyx and different types of marbles on the interior, this highly uh, active pattern uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the ground here. Uh, this is Emerald Alat Architects. This is a mosque uh, using some natural stone techniques and also concrete. And uh, you can see water again. Uh, and uh, all these are kind of pulled together with some reinforced concrete uh, for a mosque outside uh, the suburbs of Istanbul. How natural stone masonry, these, these, uh, these kind of walls create this, this texture, but it's kind of balanced with, uh, balanced with a... Uh, uh, appreciation uh, of uh, light and uh, reflection off of water and natural elements. I find this a very biophilic building. Uh, uh, and as a mosque, it's, it's, it's set new benchmarks for how mosque architecture can be organized uh, uh, and designed. Uh, this reinforced concrete working with the natural stone surfaces. Again, another mosque using the same principles, but with andesite uh, in Ankara by Hilmi Yunar and Hussein Bitunar the Mogan Mosque, you can see that andesite surface that we talked about earlier. Tabano Old, old Architects, this is a exterior facade in uh, Bodrum. Um, and uh, we can see here 
both the cladding and on the interiors, uh, we have extensive use of this kind of grayish marble from the Western Aegean area. Mutlu Çilingiroğlu Küçük Çekmece City Hall, we have here Travertine. Uh, Travertine uh, uh, is seen as a kind of more simpler uh, type of natural stone, but lately it's gained popularity because of its natural techniques, the natural veining. So I think this building, this is a public, this is a municipal hall, uh, elevated uh, the notion of Travertine uh, in, 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 in architecture in Turkey, especially. As, as well as this building, Emre Alad Architects, the Palmarina. Uh, this is in Bodrum, where it's all different types of travertines, different coursing techniques, uh, different textures, different colors. But again, it's all in travertine. Uh, so uh, one material, different surfaces, different colors, simplifies really your, as an architect, it kind of simplifies what you're doing because you're focused on that one material. But all the different opportunities uh, that the material presents gives you uh, 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 an ability to articulate your volumes and your uh, and your uh, geometries in, in, in different ways. Uh, and this was used in the advertising. This is by uh, own architects and Johnson Architects. It's a hotel. And here I like this project where you have these shiny marble interiors, but then you have these natural stone walls on the exterior. And this is in a kind of Aegean architecture. Uh, you can see here uh, it's the Aegean setting. Uh, also uh, blends in with reinforced concrete, but the interior of these marbles, uh, working with the natural stone walls with embedded marble bits, uh, mosaic bits. Uh, here we have uh, a green local marble uh, under the pool. So, you know, all these different stones working together to, to really uh, express the character of this area in Bodrum, both the vernacular architecture, but also uh, this, green this green marbles uh, working with the natural setting. On to Mac taken again, natural stone in the Aegean, the B2 house. And in this house also we have a natural stone uh, on uh, the wall and also on top of the building, uh, embedded within the steel structure. Genghis Bektaj, we have a stone, concrete, timber uh, working together. Nevzat Sain, this is a kind of ekol that was in Turkey for many, many years, this natural stones with reinforced concrete. Uh, Devs that sign an important local architect using the vernacular. And then finishing up with a couple more last buildings, Preydak Architects. This is a building outside of Turkey in Qatar, where we have these very large split face, uh, split face uh, uh, travertine blocks on the surface, as you can see them here, very, very large, uh, and creating this kind of uh, facade with different, as you can see, when the sun hits it, each piece uh, at its particular angle, particular texture provides different. Uh, Different, uh, different appearances. And in the interior, we have a more uh, a serene, more calm uh, beige. Gyokan Abjo Architects, again in Bodrum, uh, uh, with a kind of travertine uh, facade on these elements, uh, and, and, a, and a local Bodrum. And then the last building I want to show is in New York. This is by Nazim Kuzul Sanjar. This is a facade. Uh, we talk a lot about facades, and this is a uh, uh, this facade has is a is a has, has that uh, uh, is actually on a composite uh, panel, so it has it's a veneer uh, stone uh, uh, from Turkey. It's a it's a uh, I believe it's one of the, it's a basalt. So it's a veneer on a panel and allowing the facade to be much lighter. Uh, and also with regard to corrosion and pollution uh, in an urban setting, would be able to deal with that. And also in terms of uh, sustainability and recyclability. Uh, uh, it's sitting on aluminum, so it's easy to recycle. Here, it's in its industrial setting in uh, in um, New York. Oh, sorry, I thought that was the last one. We have one last uh, by uh, R two three again back on the Aegean, kind of temple like uh, art gallery for Arcas. Uh, so architecture, just to complete, you know, architecture and construction, the performance, durability of natural stone is important. Uh, installation, insulation, maintenance are the key issues we have with uh, with uh, uh, stone. So you want to make sure, I think this is uh, something that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, that Craig will talk about all these all these issues. Uh, and this is my talk and our talk today was sponsored by Turkish Stones. It's a promotional band, uh, brand promoted by the Istanbul Mineral Exporters Association. Um, and uh, Turkey is the whole night of natural stone uh, situated in the middle of the Alpine Himalayan belt. 
uh, its unique geography has many types of different stones uh, 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 and the industry uh, in Turkey takes advantage of these thousands of knowledge in stone architecture uh, and innovative products uh, with technology to make the luxury of natural stone accessible. Uh, Turkish stones, as we showed, out, this is a variety of Turkish stones, each from a particular geography of Turkey, uh, Anatolia, Marmara, Elazar, these Mula. Uh, you can see the natural stone quarries uh, in Turkey with all these types I talked about today, existing throughout the geography, West and East, and also the different color opportunities. Turkey is the leading exporter, uh, leading exporter with $1.8 billion exports, uh, very large industry that can do a lot with uh, natural stone and architecture. So thank you very much. Uh, hopefully I got in there on time uh, and uh, uh, showed you what the possibilities, op architecture op opportunities of natural stone from Turkey is. Thank you very much. I think we're now gonna see a brief uh, video. Uh, well, thank you very much, Gurkhan. That was a fascinating run through the, the qualities and attributes of stone and some intriguing information about how the different veining and colouring occurs as a result of uh, very long physical processes uh, below ground of which we know little. And I was very struck by the, um, let's say, the distinction between manufactured uh, products uh, and what you might call refined products, uh, the kind of raw nature of what we saw coming out of the ground. And then this incredible kind of sophisticated end product uh, derived from uh, polishing and cutting uh, or uh, texturing and, and roughing up, depending on, on what it is you want to achieve. And we're now going to uh, ask Craig Copeland to talk to us from the point of view of a practicing architect, but his interest in, in stone is partly through his activities as sort of an, an artist and a sculptor, uh, as well as an architect. Um, he's working on some big projects. I think we're going to see something of, a, of an important building on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington. But Craig, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, Gurkhan, thank you. That was a great presentation. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm ready to, <laughs> you, you pretty much covered the whole world um, through the perspective of, of Turkey. It's pretty amazing. Um, some really great examples and a really clear description of just the amazing possibilities um, with stone. And Jeremy, thank you for launching us into uh, what I look forward to as a longer conversation after I have my presentation. Um, touching upon really the qualities of stone. And I think that those qualities of, of uh, durability, of color, uh, those are clearly ones that come to mind. Sustainability, the fact that it's a connection to nature, not just that it's natural, but it, it gives us 
uh, an opportunity. As, as Paul was saying, we don't have the ability today to, as a, to, to touch the stone uh, in this conference or in this, this conversation, but um, what I'm gonna be showing you today is very much this, this kind of, this conceptual tact tactile aspect of stone that has been really at the core of my interest in stone. Um, I'm very interested in the, the color of stone, the, the, the actual color of stone, but it's the texture of stone, um, not just in its final form, but also in the process. So um, with that, I'm gonna share my screen. And so um, it's in line with this idea of a renewed perspective. Um, and what I wanna start with is kind of give a little bit of a background of how I've come to uh, working with stone and, and, um, and we will be, you'll see that there'll be this weaving of, of this theme of coloring uh, and texture in stone. Um, I want to start by talking about a project that I curated. It was a it was an art exhibit with four artists, myself included, and it was titled Liquid Stone. And the the idea was to to think of stone and to, just to think of it in a in a broader sense um, in terms of time. Um, here you see two images juxtaposed. Um, both of them are moments in time, uh, thanks to the to the camera. Um, one of those moments in time is more extended, and that's typically the way we see stone. Um, water, on the other hand, is happening very quickly, but they're both, they're both liquid when you, when you really think about it, especially marble. Um, this came out of an idea um, that was a collaboration with an artist that I had worked with um, for many years going back to graduate school. Um, William Steiger. He and I were, were paired together and in, on this theme of renewed perspective, we were paired because we were asked uh, everybody, they had eight artists and eight architects. This was a studio that Frank Gehry and Kleiss Oldenburg were teaching and they wanted to get artists and architects to work together. It was my first chance to collaborate and really broaden my own perspectives. Um, so what came out of that um, specifically was this idea of a hydrotherapy center, but more importantly was a process of collaborating um, in this case with another artist. And that led, you know, many years later to this idea of, of liquid stone, where we, we juxtaposed our, our ideas about, about um, time and material. And I think that's a big, that's an important way to think about stone. Uh, is is that time is is ever present? It's a it's a memory of time and a reminder of time. Um, so the the one one of the pieces that I showed you see here on the right uh, is these are these three sprouts, and this is a conceptual piece of three seeds that are conceptually starting as cubes, and after a gestation, a conceptual gestation of two or three months how would those seeds, those cubic seeds begin to germinate? Um, and this is, this is the way that I like to play with the idea of time um, and the use of stone. Two colleagues who were also featured, you see them on the left, uh, also play with this idea of the plasticity of stone. And these are pieces that um, they call Smurfs and they are very plastic, but they're, they're made out of the dolomitic, the very, hard dolomitic stone that, that Gherkin was talking about. Uh, they even had a video in this particular um, exhibit uh, that was an animation of one of these pieces moving around to launch your, your imagination into this plasticity and movement that's associated with it. Um, but, but actually a, a precursor to this was my first hands-on carving which you see here, this is this was um, this incorporated traditional pointing techniques, which is something that goes back um, thousands of th millennia, really, um, in terms of 
building up models and then using a pointing technique where you actually go point by point, you're doing a kind of a dot to dot uh, in 3D. And I wanted to go through this process in part to um, understand how you excavate stone and what happens as you excavate stone. Uh, in this case, in a very intimate way, this is a, what I would call a tabletop sculpture, which is a lot of my work. Um, a few years later, I had an opportunity to do a monumental sculpture uh, and begin some of my monumental carvings. And this particular piece, like the, uh, the first one that you saw, the Anello uh, Retorto, this one, Anello Echo, was an opportunity to not only use traditional um, processes of, of modeling in clay, plaster, and pointing, but also to use emerging technologies with the computer to actually scan and put this in the computer and then to, um, to then procure the, the blocks of stone and to do it in uh, a somewhat methodological way so that um, given the scale, uh, it, could be, uh, it could be attained uh, and, and stay on track to, to a certain extent. So this is me working on it, uh, everything done with handheld tools but again, using um, to initiate this using um, a combination of traditional uh, uh, concepts or uh, traditional um, approaches, incorporating that with the with the computer. Um, and what what's fascinating at this scale is that really the this is you're you're starting to get at a larger scale than the intimate tabletop pieces, and you really. Can, can get lost in this, this idea that you're, you're immer immersed in this quarry of sorts. Uh, and here you see some of those steps along the way. And then the final, um, or as I say, the, the substantially complete because um, uh, there's always something that you see and an opportunity that you might wanna return to. This, this is something that, um, this, you know, this is giving you a little bit of background from my perspective as an artist and my approach to stone. Um, another perspective uh, to my approach to stone comes through the design world. And I've been very fortunate for um, over a decade to be teaming with a number of different stone companies uh, in a, uh, an annual uh, event called Marmamac. And um, with that, there's an opportunity that the idea of Marmomac, the Marmo of Marmomac is marble or stone, the Mac is machines. And so this is an opportunity for companies to demonstrate their marbles, to, to demonstrate their fabrication, or in this case, uh, pairing with, with uh, artists, designers, and architects like myself to, to see what are the possibilities um, using contemporary tools. In this case, you see on the left, a diamond wire. And the idea was to create this very thin panel, but something that's more plastic. And you could see on the right side, getting it to 2CM, it's, it not only has its structural integrity, but it also has a um, translucency. It really showcases both of those aspects. Here you see some of the, um, some of the concepts behind it. And then this is actually at Marmomac, where you, you can see the, the, um, the demonstration of, of the application of those different aspects. This continued with a number of different companies, um, in this case, uh, going into the possibilities of furniture production, uh, working with a travertine company. And uh, again, this idea of showcasing what's possible in terms of stone. Some of the things that Gertrude was showing you, the idea of being fully immersed in stone, of creating this uh, fully immersive environment that is, uh, in this case, architecture, design, and art, although the art is, is somewhat um, camouflaged in this particular case. Always with these, with these particular, um, uh, these fairs, it, there are these opportunities to, to kind of showcase, to, to study and to showcase what each company's capabilities are. In this case, working with the idea of not just a diamond wire, but also a robotic carving to create these, these three-dimensional 
columns, uh, again, combining um, traditional approaches, but using uh, contemporary technology. And out of this, uh, um, a few years back, I was invited by the, the overall organizers of Marlomac to, to, um, to collaborate with two companies I had never worked with before and come up with a way to showcase the capabilities of stone today. And, and what emerged out of it was this very thin, um, uh, very thin cladding of, of stone that is actually on a double curve and uh, it's attached to these metal, um, this metal frame, but it also became an opportunity to showcase the infusion of, of um, design in the case of these wire cut um, chairs or stools that become a bench, as well as uh, also some, some um, uh, stone sculpture pieces that were all part of this to showcase again, these, these capabilities and possibilities. Um, after, after many years of, of um, working with Marmomac, um, there was an opportunity to, to, um, to transcend that event and to actually, in tandem with my architectural practice, to create a studio, a design studio that focused on um, some of these things that I was able to do in Marmomac. Uh, which was to focus on stone furniture. And so my feeling was that maybe the, the foundation of that should be creating what I called an essential stone collection. And the basic idea was to create uh, a singular piece that could be the, the, the central piece in each of, of different rooms, either in, in a residence, in a commercial space, or in hospitality, you know, it could be a lounge table, it could be a dining table, a desk, a bookcase, something that would be essential for any of those. And in this case, looking at travertine in particular, um, and, and then starting to break it down, literally trying to understand what would the, what would the component pieces be. Um, and as I was doing this, I started reaching out to, um, to some of the same companies that I had been working with so that we could do fabrication and continue the collaboration uh, and also expanding it. Um, and I, I thought that if there was uh, an essential detail that, um, that one of these fabricators could come up with, maybe it would begin a, uh, this mock-up would become a conversation. Uh, here you can see on the desktop, a number of, of pieces. And one of the companies that I ended up working with turned out to be a Turkish company and um, and it began it, it it was it was the perfect combination because they were they were responding specifically to what I was trying to achieve but they also had ideas and it became this um, everything I wanted it to be in terms of a dialogue on um, what might be possible with with the stone so um, we agreed that it would make sense for me to visit them. So I went to their, their, um, their factory in Belejik, Turkey, which is like two hours, a little bit over two hours outside of Istanbul. Um, and it's actually where the Ottoman Empire began. It's, it's right on the Silk Road. So it's a very interesting historical location. But it's, it's in this factory that I was able to um, really talk to the engineers, talk to the developers, the, the people that were um, working with the material and begin to see what are the different um, possibilities in terms of combining um, solid pieces of stone and various laminations of stone and uh, stone to stone and stone to metal. And it really took, took the research to a whole nother level. And out of that, um, we developed uh, a few of the first mock-up pieces. Uh, here you see the, the uh, dining table, which with the exception of a couple of metal fasteners is, and also um, the, a, a, an epoxy uh, netted fabric that's between two, two thin pieces of stone. This is all stone. So this is, this is 95, what you're looking at is 95% stone. Um, and the idea was to, 
to again create these essential pieces and starting with this idea of could you make furniture that's that's contemporary that's lighter uh completely out of stone um and and you know taking taking advantage of those those aspects of durability uh they got the largest person in the factory to sit on this but we also had this guy and other people sitting on it was clearly um, very strong and, and it was uh, it fulfilled those aspects. But but one thing um, that still for me personally was was a little bit short on was the fact that um, going with all stone um, made the pieces still too too heavy. So um, staying in Turkey began to look at possibilities of collaborating with um, some metal fabricators uh, in this in this case in Istanbul and started to develop this combination of this very thin light um, laminate stone in combination with a metal frame and developed the next round of mock-ups um, which was you know again trying to showcase this very really the, the possibilities of getting a, a much thinner stone using today's um, today's possibilities of um, of lamination uh, and then just developing that in tandem um, with with the metal fabricator and then here you see the the, the pieces as they're um, as they're being finished um, just to put a little note here um, to to notice this particular material this is this is a uh, a dark olive um, stone from Turkey, and this becomes an important point uh, as as um, I proceed in this this um, presentation. So here you see um, the final the final um, dining table. It looks like a, a rendering because the the photographer was obsessed with making this look like a rendering. But this is, I assure you, this is actually a photograph that's been heavily doctored around it. Um, as are these. These are pieces that were all shown here in New York City um, in 2019, really showcasing this, this, um, this, the possibility with this lamination technique where there's stone on both sides of a very thin piece of stone. And so this, this is important background because as I said, um, that, that one particular stone, the dark olive, um, became essential as as I was working more and more during the development of the um, of the furniture. I was working on this particular project, which is 2100 Penn Avenue, which um, I'll give you a little bit of background on it. But what I want to talk about is primarily this central element in the uh, the public um, interior, which is this monumental stone stair that was. Um, that comes from Turkish stone. It was fabricated in Turkey. So the, the project itself is located on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's on the north campus of George Washington University. And what's important is that because of this unique site, it's, it's really a U-shaped building. And there's, as a result, um, what developed was a very large atrium space, which you'll see in a moment. And this, this whole connection to Pennsylvania Avenue uh, became a very important conceptual and, and spatial connection to, to build upon. Here in New York City, we have the, the Flatiron Building, which you see here on the left uh, in Barcelona, the Casa Mila. Both of these buildings um, I thought were great precedents for us because of how they address this, this idea of a very prominent corner uh, more so in the case of the Casa Mila because it has this truncated facade um, thanks to Serdar's uh, master plan where at every intersection he would truncate the corners and create these, these small flat facades. What I, what I saw as a great opportunity was this plasticity of the form, not so much the materials um, in this case, even though we're talking about stone, but this idea of the undulation so that you are not just being addressed by a form that's coming at you, but you also have this form that's waving and it's, it's really reaching out and embracing you. And so um, one of the, one of, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of Alvaro Alto, 
um, both um, because of his his um, his study as an his his work as an architect, but also work uh, as a designer. And the Alto Vase I thought was was appropriate in terms of its its um its qualities of this undulation. Um, in tandem with that is this idea of just thinking about Pennsylvania Avenue itself and the idea of what that what the name Pennsylvania Avenue means, um, which which comes comes back to um, the the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, it's interesting that's no accident that this is a, a very prominent avenue in Washington, D.C. Um, Thomas Jefferson was, was very careful to make a nod to Pennsylvania because there were many who didn't think that the, the capital should have come to, um, to Washington, D.C. So instead, the idea was, well, why don't you, instead of it going to Philadelphia, why don't you bring Pennsylvania to, to um, Washington, D.C. by creating this very prominent avenue? And the site is actually located there. Um, but, but to the point that I'm trying to make is that it became an opportunity for this interior to celebrate this connection to not just Pennsylvania, but the idea of, of this forest, which it's named after. Um, and in this case, you can see that, again, looking at some precedents here again with, with Alto, this, this idea of this waving wood. And what was really important as, as this developed more and more was a grounding to this wavy wood. And that was almost like a stream going through this um, to do this the way that a stream can carve a mountain and carve the rock. And that was the concept that emerged for the stair itself, studying the way that you could, you could get this elevational change, but also really embrace, embrace that and to play with some of the things that Gurkhan was, was talking about. And, and I think some of the things that we'll continue to talk about, um, both Paul and Jeremy were, were touching upon it. This idea of, of texture and color um, and, and this, this stone that I was telling you, this dark olive, what I really liked about it, and you could see it here in the rendering, is that a single stone could have different aspects to it. It could celebrate um, the different colors that are that are imbued in the in the stone. In this case, the lighter gray that you see is is a result of a texturing of the surface, uh, and the the darker is by a polishing of the surface. And then playing with it further, um, some of the things that that Gurkhan was showing you this this kind of patterning. So it's it's really it's 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 not trying to to um, imitate nature, it's trying to emulate the qualities of nature and really celebrate the possibilities of patterning uh, in a very contemporary way. So it was very important to me to go to the quarry and this, the quarry itself is located in the center of Turkey uh, in, a, in an area called Sivas. Um, and you could see uh, these different, even um, by wetting it, you can kind of create the, the, um, the effect of the polishing of the stone. And here working with uh, the fabricator as well as with, with the, um, the installer and the, the client, we had a mock-up made to get, to, to, to make sure we were understanding, um, there, was a, there was a collective understanding of expectations of what, what were going to be the qualities of the texture, what were going to be the resulting um, colors and surface features. And um, through a, a number, I think we had four or five dry lays, we laid out the entire, um, the entire field of stone for this lobby and um, built up all of the walls and uh, the stair itself so that we could see how these were all working together in tandem. Um, and then here you can see it, this is actually, these are installation photos that were taken um, just a few weeks ago. Um, at this point, uh, the majority of the, of, the, of the floor has been installed. Here you can see them doing some of the, that installation. 
Uh, and you can see that that combination of of this this reading like it's it's a solid block of stone that's been carved, but clearly with a with a, a nod or a wink with with the infusion or the the um, the weaving of this pattern, um, just to the kind of take advantage of 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 um, a, another level of of um, of of expression. We also um, were able to carry that not just uh, in the, the lobby itself, but also in the bathrooms. And again, here, these, this is the same material, it's dark olive. And I think this is, a great, this is a great way to think of this material and to think of stone in general, is that it's through the texturing that you can really begin to, um, to demonstrate and, and capture the light and the color variations. And I think that's that's um, that's really at the heart of what um, this in, on this particular project with this particular material is something that I'm, I'm very happy uh, we were able to to achieve. Um, still continuing to work with the same company, um, and um, it's interesting. Gurkhan was showing at the end of his presentation a project here in New York City, which uses these panel systems. Um, I think that's something that I know we're not going to, we're not really talking about what's happening behind the scenes, but it's also a very big part of what's making stone possible today is not just what you could do on the surface, but what you can do to, to kind of augment um, some of the things that traditionally have made it um, more difficult to work with. And that is the fact that it is very durable, but it's also, it can be very heavy. And if you, if you team it with another material, there are great opportunities for um, making it more accessible for more applications. And as they say in Turkey, Teşekkürler. thank you. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, a wonderful presentation and uh, a kind of very different and excellent follow up to uh, Gerkan's earlier uh, thing. I guess we have um, five or six minutes left uh, uh, on this webinar. Uh, Gherkin, I just want to deal with a couple of technical questions that have come in uh, from mm -hmm. the audience, which I think you can deal with very briefly. One right. is, um, are there any um, structural systems that are particularly suitable uh, for stone cladding? I'm uh, guessing the answer to that is that, you know, any any sort of structure or structural material can be adapted to take stone. Uh, yeah, I mean, with natural stone tiles on on uh, building facades, the mechanical anchorage systems, uh, obviously both uh, hand uh, and uh, uh, basically screwed in, but uh, I think the, the key challenge there is for taller buildings, uh, depending on how how tall your building is, um, then you have issues of how thick uh, your uh, pieces of stone are. So uh, these are balances one needs to make depending on uh, how much of the facade you want to clad, how tall your building is, the thickness, different uh, opportunities there. And I think this uh, these kind of back ventilated uh, facades, I think a little bit more, present more opportunities these days because you don't have to necessarily do a whole building. You can do sections of it. And I think uh, you still get that natural stone quality without having to, to worry about, you know, you know, the famous problem of turning corner, which, which uh, Craig kind of mentioned is always this problem in architecture where you can get these fields. So I think these uh, opportunities to use mechanical anchorage and fixing systems um, uh, depend on uh, the overall height and width of your building and the kind of expressive qualities you want to give. Thank uh, you. But the, the, the second one uh, from Nizrina Iskandar in Indonesia. Um, and this isn't about uh, weight or size. This is about stones or, or that may be particularly suitable um, working in hot and humid climates. Now I'm guessing Turkey is hot. Um, so stone works in, in <coughs> hot climates, but what about humid climates? What about what about the tropics? Uh, does stone respond well to that? Are there particular stones that are more suitable? Uh, tropics, you have the uh, uh, 
the, the, the surface treatments of the uh, of things like marble. I think you need to be more aware of how much uh, because marble will uh, will uh, take in some water, uh, as will travertine, and that can kind of it's, it's a long term issue. So uh, the harder marbles, I think, would be more appropriate. Some of the dolomites that I showed, where the crystal uh, physics of it prevents uh, 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 prevents a certain uh, 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 water getting into the in, in, into your into your stone bits. Um, uh, but so, you know, with regard to the examples I've seen in the tropics, uh, also uh, certain volcanic stones, um, uh, uh, igneous stones, uh, such as these um, uh, basalts and andesites, they're very, very durable stones. They're not as polished, but I think they do give opportunities uh, to really weather over time and uh, require less uh, uh, even if it, uh, water gets into them, they require less uh, less maintenance. So I think those two stones, harder harder uh, uh, than marble dolomites, and then uh, particular types of volcanic stones, I think for the tropics would be more recommended. Thank you very much. Um, Jeremy, I wanted to bring you in because of your own interest in um, art and sculpture as well as architecture. Um, and perhaps make a comment on what you heard from Craig, because this is an unusual presentation. I mean, I, I, I know people who trained as architects who became sculptures, uh, scu uh, sculptors, um, and I know architects who collect sculptors, but I think it's really quite unusual to have somebody who's both a live architect and a live sculptor. And I wonder if any thoughts emerged during that presentation about this sort of relationship. Well, I, I think this is an extremely interesting one, and despite all the um, sort of uh, noise and uh, flannel around the relationship between art, art and architecture, actually there are very few really specific studies I'm aware of about the relationship between sculpture and architecture. I think one of the few was done by Penelope Curtis, who was one of our speakers last year, the curator um, initially at the Henry Moore Institute, then at uh, Tate. Britain and Natalie at the Kulbenkian in Lisbon. Um, but I, I think I have two main thoughts really, uh, Craig, while we were talking. One was, uh, we've just had an exhibition here in London with Liguchi, who of course was both a consummate sculptor and a consummate furniture designer. Um, and most of the sculpture I'm, I'm aware of at least is, is stone. I'm not sure he ever used it in furniture design or furniture production. But still, there's something of the forms that he uses and you use, um, which uh, I think suggests an affinity. But the other thing, and I think even stronger than the affinity with Noguchi, is the um, sense that one gets in the uh, Academia Gallery in Florence of the incomplete sculptures that Michelangelo was making for the tomb of, I think, Julius II, his uh, patron. The prisoner. And in them, you, you know, these are uh, uh, unfinished lumps of stone in which you can see a human figure beginning to emerge or being released by Michelangelo's sort of stonemasonry skill. And I think that's an extraordinary sense of how you can wrest something from this natural object, this, this stone, which has all sorts of qualities, and all sorts of qualities which we can't really uh, control ourselves. You can only allow it to be what it wants to be by the, the, the use of your skill and your judgment. And I, I, I found that one of the most moving experiences of going to an art gallery, and I've been to a few, um, and it still, even though I haven't been there for 20 years, it stays in my mind as something quite extraordinary because it really is something about the physical and spiritual, something about form and meaning, and something about experience, about empathy, that one empathizes with these souls trapped in the, uh, in the stone that Michelangelo was trying to free. Um, but I, th th so those, uh, not that that relates directly to your building on Pennsylvania Avenue, but those are senses I think that one can get of the potential of stone um, to become an expressive material. 
And I think the way you use it, Pennsylvania Avenue, was, was quite magnificent in all sorts of different ways. You said it from its light reflecting qualities to its uh, textures to its um, massive uh, qualities. And I think that's something that um, architects would do well to consider more closely than often they do. Craig, any comment? Yeah, I mean, um, wow. <laughs> what, what I would say about um, touching upon what, what you're saying, Jeremy, um, first of all, Noguchi, his, his, um, his museum and his, his studio is about a mile from where I started my, um, my, uh, my stone design company. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of his as a, um, not just as a designer and a sculptor, but also as a as a landscape um, as a landscape designer, or really a placemaker in the way that he used stone in placemaking, I think it's pretty amazing. Um, in the case of Michelangelo, also I'm I'm very enamored with uh, not just his his uh, incredible skill uh, for the pieces that we that are, are usually showcased, but for the, for the very ones that you're talking about, like the prisoner and also his Pieta that's, that's in Milan, partly it's, you know, it's, it's kind of an indulgence on my part because you can see kind of the process. You can see the natural rock uh, and you can see how um, through the tools, uh, Michelangelo is working with it. And I think that's true with, with Noguchi and that's very much uh, the sensibility that I'm very interested in, uh, the more I work with stone, is letting letting the textures come forward, letting letting the qualities of the natural material come forward in different ways, and not just impose a, a preformed idea on the material, but really respond to the natural qualities. Because I think that that's that's how you really amplify the use of stone. I think that's rather a good note on which to bring this webinar to a close. I've been intrigued by it, as I'm sure our uh, visitors from around the world have been. Um, and I'm struck by um, certain connections which were uh, very unexpected for me. For example, um, Gherkin, you, you were showing uh, these, um, these, these stone crafted building facades of buildings which had actually been incorporated into the geology and the topography of their surroundings uh, from millennia ago, which would seem such a, a strange idea um, to us now. But in a way, <laughs> that it sort of exemplified the possibility of uh, exploiting the natural, or let's say responding to the natural in one sense, but then exploiting it by taking something from these materials um, and transforming them, going on to Craig's presentation, either by sculptural and craft skills, or uh, probably more relevant for most architects, through the sort of technologies which are opening up new worlds for stone. No longer does it have to support its own weight. It can be a thin, translucent, almost lightweight material, especially where used in combination with quite simple technologies and, and simple other materials. And I was also struck by, let's say, the relationship between a hybrid facade system where you may be using stone for effect and for light, um, what lies behind it, is support, uh, ventilation and, and air and different materials. And then in your, own, um, in your own furniture work, your explorations into seeing that actually, rather than making everything uh, of stone, however attractive that might be in the sense of it, everything being authentic, that the power of the hybrid uh, to combine things ends up with, with something which is just as beautiful um, but has a, a has a sort of different league in terms of practicality and weight and I guess and I guess mobility. 
So I didn't quite imagine that all these thoughts would arise when we were talking about this seminar. And I think it just goes to show uh, that an exploration of, um, of a powerful material uh, like stone, which I think we all think is rather, uh, rather not so much underestimated, but let's, shall we say, unexamined um, in terms of, of, of really uh, profound possibilities of, of how it can be used in different circumstances. And I was reminded as a sort of final point that um, Emre Aralat's beautiful mosque uh, which won, award, won an award at World Architecture Festival a, a few years ago, um, was one of those examples where the, the combination of tradition and modernity, architecturally speaking, was echoed uh, in the use of, you know, an eternal material like stone, but then on the other hand, uh, the addition where appropriate um, of concrete. And it's surely this kind of, this synthesis of ideas, uh, materials, techniques, and aesthetics, um, which might be said to be really the world in which architecture operates at its best. So may I thank Turkish Stones for making this webinar possible. Thank you very much, Gurkhan Karakut. Thank you. And Craig Copeland for your contributions today. And I hope this conversation about stone will continue at World Architecture Festival and elsewhere. And thank you very much for your time today.